All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to Shumla Lunch and Learn. Today is July 13th, 2022. Uh, I am Jessica Hamlin, uh, Shumla Executive Director, and going to give you kind of an intro today to the rock art of the Lower Pecos, to Shumla, um, what we are doing to preserve the rock art, and our most recent project, the Hearthstone Project. Um, so excited to see so many wonderful people. Please, um, if you will, keep yourselves on mute and we will have lots of time in the end for questions. So um, jot down your questions or send them in the, um, the message if you have any, um, and we will get to those at the end. I am going to share my screen and get set up here real quick. And here we go. All right. Well, here we are. Let's, um, so since this is an intro, I really am going to begin with kind of just the very basics of where we are in, in space and time and um, how this rock art came to be. So, um, so here we go. This it, lovely place is the Lower Pecos Canyonlands. Um, back here, I, and I have gotten a big um, pointer now, so I've had trouble with pointers in the past, so hopefully you can see my pointer. Um, this is Shumla Campus. And as you can see, aside from our, our one little internet pole, from where I'm standing, you can't see anything uh, man-made aside from our, our campus. It is a beautiful, beautiful landscape. Um, it is made up of deep canyons and limestone rock shelters right here on the eastern edge of the Chihuahuan Desert. Here's Del Rio, you see Eagle Pass. So this is the Rio Grande River right here just to give you a little sense of where you are. Here again, you can see the Lower Pecos Canyonlands Archaeological District is now a national landmark. Uh, we achieved that last year, I'm very excited about that. It lies here on the border of Texas and Coahuila, Mexico. And here the Pecos River, the Devil's River, and the Rio Grande River um, and their tributaries have formed deep canyons cut into limestone and thousands of rock shelters like this one. These cool dry places were home to hunter-gatherer peoples for over 13,000 years. And to put that in perspective a little bit, if you think of modern history, that part of Texas history that we all hear about with Cabeza de Vaca and the Alamo is just this tiny section on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. All of the rest of it, all the other thousands of years is many, many, years of humans who walked on this land before us. The Lower Pecos contains some of the best preserved and longest records of hunter-gatherer lifeways in the United States. And here you can see our friends at the Ancient Southwest Texas Project excavating in Eagle Cave, um, led by Dr. Steve Black at Texas State University. Above the deposits, which you can see here, along the rock shelter walls and cliff overhangs, the people of the Pecos, as they're often called, painted a rich record of highly complex polychromatic mural art. And I'm gonna work on your rock art eyes with you for here, here for a second. And first we're gonna look just kind of at these deposits at the base. You see a lot of stone, that's fire cracked rock from earth ovens. Above that, all along this back wall, you can see it's almost, it's so much rock art, it's almost look, looks like a red wash across the whole base of this in, in Fate Bell. Then in this upper register, you see some very specific iconography, this box, beautiful lines, very specific um, waved patterns, and a figure here with wings. We're gonna see him again in a second. And then if you look all the way up at the roof, you can see beautiful white figures outlined in red. Can everybody see that? Yeah. These, some of these um, murals are monumental in scale, like the one that you just saw. It not only takes us, to, we have to use scaffolding to study it, they had to build scaffolding to create it. This figure, for example, with outstretched arms, beautiful off um, head turned to the side. I'm gonna zoom in so we can look a little bit more closely at that figure. Do you see that the head is kind of turned off to the side? There's sort of a headdress here, arms outstretched, the body continues down, all painted in red, except there's black across the chest here. There's black outlining the center. And then the center has been left unpainted 
for this figure, though there are images that are, that are in that space. If we get even closer to the head of this figure, you can see how incredibly perfect these lines are. Imagine standing on scaffolding with a homemade paintbrush and your homemade paint and painting these perfect, perfect lines. You can also see at this scale, the state of deterioration that we're dealing with here. Um, not only do we have a lot of spalling, which is a, a kind of a natural process that happens in limestone, but when it happens, it takes the paint with it and that paint just crumbles into dust. Um, but we also have here a dirt dauber, um, which is an insect that builds a mud nest on top of, um, well, on the stone wall, because to it, it is just a stone wall. Um, but when that dirt dauber, dauber um, vacates that nest, it, it dries out and it can cause spalling. You see another one right here. This art tradition is known as the Pecos River style. And it's the defining archeological feature of the Lower Pecos Canyonlands. We at Shumla are uncovering the secrets of this ancient communication and preserving them for generations to come. See Diana and Seamus who is on the call today and Carolyn um, and Ashley Busby all on a recent, recent um, effort in Fateville Shelter. There are over 300 panels north of the border likely as many south of the border. And this is just a dot map of a few of them. Um, so it gives you a, a sense of scale of how many of these sites there are. And you can see these dots are centered along the rivers, which is partially because we think there are quite a few along the rivers, that's where the rock shelters are predominantly, but also because some of the other regions haven't been um, you know, researched yet. So there's so, so much more to, to be discovered. These murals were painted as compositions with pattern, purpose, complex reasoning to communicate. And we know this for so many reasons, and I'm gonna to start to tell you how. The first and, and one of the most important clues that the paintings um, are compositional is that they are rule governed. Using this tiny portable microscope, which on your screen is actually probably larger than it actually is in real life. It's about the size of two double D batteries we are able to see the intersections of where paint layers overlap at microscopic detail. So we take hundreds of photomicrographs per site that we visit and do triple blind determinations of paint sequencing. So for example, in this picture, the white is the limestone wall, the black paint and the red paint are there. So our um, archeologists would look at this, this photograph at the context photographs around it, microphotographs, and determine what layer is painted on top of what. And here it looks pretty clear that the red was painted on top of the black. Here you can see it even more closely. We take um, at very high resolution, these um, photomicrographs, and you can see for sure that this red paint is on top of this, this black paint. In 98 to 99% of our photomicrograph determinations, we have found that the artists had a strict painting sequence, applying all black paint first, followed by all the red, then all the yellow, and finally all the white. So look at this figure at White Shaman. This figure is painted in red. It has a black mask across where the eyes would be. It has red antlers with black dots at the end of the tines. The red arms outstretched and hold, um, these are extra spears and possibly a, a stick of some kind. And then on this side, an atlatl that has a, steer, a spear loaded into it. It has a beautiful black wrist adornment that trails down here. It has a big um, elbow adornment on the other arm. And then if you look down, you can see here a yellow, kind of crenellated line that goes along the side with black infill and then a red line. So now I'm gonna make it much easier for you to see this. <laughs> okay, now this is going, I'm gonna show you how the paint layers on this figure were interwoven. I'm going to hit play and you'll see the black, then red, then yellow, then white patterning. First, all the black was painted, then the red arch, then the red body of the figure, 
then the yellow crenellation, then the white line on top. Now, if you think about this, in order to start in this way and end up with that, you had to know exactly what it was that you were painting. And it also shows a very interesting thing. If you start with, for example, this black dot, then when you paint the red body, the notched sphere goes over that black dot. Then when you paint the yellow arch or crenellation, that is painted over the red. So you can see that the figures across these murals are interwoven together. And this will be important here in just a second. Right here on, this, on the white shaman mural. So it is actually a, a quite small figure in terms of the, the entire mural itself. I am going to erase the paint and then I'm going to play it for you the way that it was painted. And you can watch the, the paint sequencing. There's all the black. Do you see all the dots? There's the red. And now the yellow is added. And finally, the white. All those black dots, if you were going to paint a figure that was red, outlined in white, and had black dots in it, don't you think you'd paint the black dots last? Not in this case. And this is the, the, the true discovery that, that Carolyn Boyd made at this at White Shaman um, Shelter and White Shaman Mural that helped us to really know that though we felt for sure that these were compositional just based on the way that they were painted, that they truly were painted compositionally because it would be almost impossible for someone to have accidentally started with black and then later somebody else came back and painted in red and later somebody else came in and painted in yellow. That just doesn't really make sense, does it? Now, this is one of the smaller murals um, in the Lower Pecos Canyon lands. It's 32 feet long. It also required scaffolding to produce and a great deal of planning and preparation. And one thing that we can't forget about too is the communal sacrifice of animal fat off everyone's plate in order to make the paint. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that too as we keep going. These murals across the, the landscape are also highly patterned. We find specific motifs repeated over and over across the landscape crenellated arches, in being impaled, impaled dots, impaled deer, speech breath, the dots and lines that emanate out of the mouths of the figures, um, ecstatic hair, as it's called, and um, antlers with dots at the ends of the antler tines, so wavy lines, boxes, uh, boxes with legs, <laughs> as we sometimes call them in the field. So let's look at this figure, not Dr. Diana alone, but this figure back here. Do you see a black mask? This is the head, sort of ears, almost like bear's ears. Red antlers with black dots at the end of the antler tines. Now I'm gonna make this easier to see as well. There you go. But it loses the color in this line drawing, but you get the idea. The head is, is here again, this kind of bear's ears, the antlers with black dots. In this case, this figure is winged. And because of that, um, the hands are no longer outstretched. They now kind of come out of the shoulders of the figure. Can you see that here? Big, beautiful wings, but also the stub wings and single pole ladders, which is a motif that we, we see often across the landscape. So this figure is repeated again. If you look, this is a de-stretched version or a, a filtered for color so that we can see it a bit easier of the same figure. You can see the head the mask, the ears, the red antler tines, the hands coming off the shoulders, the wings, and single pole ladders. Now it's not depicted exactly the same, but there's enough attributes there that, that would tell, tell us and would tell someone reading it from the past that this is the same figure. Here again, again, here the de-stretch really helps to see what you're looking at. We have the, the head, the sort of bear's shaped ears, the antler tines, the single pole ladders, the wings, 
the arms coming from the, the shoulders, all in the mask. And in this case, there's even a mouth coming off the top. So the, the head is lifted up and there is speech breath emanating from the mouth of this figure. Well, we were in the field one time and we saw this wall and we felt, felt like there was probably paint there. It was really, really deteriorated um, and we were hot and tired, but we went ahead and did our usual system to make sure that we, we got it documented if it was indeed paint. Took it back to the lab, ran it through D-Stretch and look who we saw. This same figure, again with this head, mask, ears, antler tines, arms, wings. It's pretty incredible. The people who viewed these paintings in the archaic period knew these attributes and they could identify these figures immediately. They read the images. You do this every day too. All right, who was that? Anybody, take yourself off mute and tell me who that was. Little Red Riding Hood. Little Red Riding Hood. You saw this picture for less than a nanosecond. And because of this red outfit, because of the wolf, you know who she is, where she's going, what she's carrying, why she's looking at this wolf sort of worried. You know what's gonna happen later. You know that when she, the wolf leaves her, the wolf is gonna go to her grandma's house. The wolf is going to take her grandma's place in the bed. You even know the conversation this little girl and this wolf are gonna have later. My, what big teeth you have. You know everything about this story and you only saw that single picture for one second. Even though it was written down, first written down over 300 years ago. So this is a really, really important point to remember when we see the rock art, we may not immediately recognize what it is and that sometimes causes our human brain to say it doesn't mean anything, but it doesn't mean anything to us yet. And that is one of the most important things that, that Shumla is doing right now is figuring out those meanings. What we've discovered and, and particularly Carolyn and her work, Carol, Dr. Carolyn Boyd, Shumla's founder, is that the patterns and attributes that we see across the landscape are, are connected to many Native American motifs and mythologies, but primarily and, and um, to, to a really large extent to the people of the, um, the kind of the Aztec and the Huichol, these people that speak a Uto Aztecan language family. Um, so ancient Aztec as well as modern day Huichol. Here you can see the Huichol um, are currently uh, still continuing their peyote pilgrimage. Um, here is a depiction, an Aztec depiction of the New Day ceremony. Um, and so many of these things we have um, contributed, you know, these attributes are found in the rock art of the Lower Pecos as well. If you were a person living in the Lower Pecos during the Archaic, you would look at the White Shaman mural here and immediately identify these figures. You would, for example, with this figure, you would see this figure as headless. This red figure has red S-shaped lines down the body, or white figure, sorry. The figure is painted in white. There is a red band across the neck. You would see these attributes and you would immediately know this is a, a moon goddess. They're always painted in white. They are associated with um, S-shaped motifs that are associated with lightning and rain and clouds, the Shana Kawili. You would know this immediately. You would know that the myth that the moon goddess saved humanity from the flood by placing a single man in a canoe. And you would expect that she be depicted with this image of a single man in a canoe. So it wouldn't surprise you at all for that to be right there at her feet. You would also know that the moon deities are decapitated. It happens every 29.5 days. The full moon turns to the new moon. Decapitation in Mesoamerica is depicted by a red band at the neck. So it wouldn't surprise you at all that she was painted with a red band at, that, at her neck. And it wouldn't surprise you either. In fact, you would expect it that at the winter solstice, the day when the moon gives power back to the sun and the days begin to lengthen, that this deity would be decapitated by the sunset. In fact, you would expect it and you might go there on that day on purpose so that you could be a part of that transition. 
It's pretty incredible. And it's pretty incredible to imagine how many times they would have had to come to this place knowing what it was that they were going to want to depict there and make marks so that they could get this just right. So even though painting this mural probably took a week, perhaps two weeks, preparing to paint this mural, preparing, deciding on the myth that was going to be depicted, deciding on the way that it was going to be depicted, making sure that all of your astrological and solar alignments were in place, going back to the site over and over again on certain days to make sure that things would line up correctly, gathering all of your resources, all of the trees and, and reeds that you need to build scaffolding, creating all the cordage you need to lash that scaffolding together, gathering the minerals for the paint, gathering the fat, which means hunting and not feeding your family, but hunting and using that fat for paint, gathering water, um, you know, all of these different, creating paintbrushes. So much effort goes into this. And this would be a communal effort among, amongst the group that was working on this. There might have been a, a single or a few specifically, um, you know, excellent artists, but the whole community would have been involved in the decision to, to create one, one of these murals. And as I told you, there are over 300. Now I have just given you a tiny taste of what Carolyn Boyd has figured out about the White Shaman mural. It is truly incredible. Um, and you really, if you can, go ahead and read the White Shaman mural book. It, it will blow your mind. Um, we sell it on the Shimla website. That, that you can also find it at Amazon. The key is that just as quickly as you identified Little Red Riding Hood, they identified their myths in, in these, um, these murals. And it's still happening today. So for example, in 2010, Matsua, a Huichol shaman, visited the Lower Pecos for the first time, and he immediately identified symbols in the art and related them to his cosmology. In 2016, Alfredo, Dr. Alfredo Lopez Austin, fortunately the late Dr. Alfredo Lopez Austin, one of the foremost authorities on Mesoamerican religions, mythologies, iconography, he recognized core motifs in the white shaman mural and related them immediately to Huichol and Nahua myths without Carolyn leading him to it. It was, it was him and they had this moment where these Mexican archeologists are just losing their minds. This is so incredible to find these mythologies so much farther back in time. And we're gonna talk a little bit about how old these, these sites are, but they are extremely ancient, over thousand, thousands of years old, far older than the Aztec Maya um, you know, civilizations and, and the Mesoamerican belief systems that we are aware of today. So I hope I have I've made it clear that everything in Pecos River style rock art carried meaning from the painting sequence to the interplay of light and shadow, even the direction of brush strokes, everything was painted to communicate. These are graphic texts like codex, like a codex, an Aztec codex like this one, a Josh Nuttall. Um, they are manuscripts of ancient Mesoamerican beliefs that are not encoded on paper because paper wasn't was they, what they had to use. They encoded them on these incredible canvases. They are books and this landscape is a library, unfortunately a disappearing library. And these books must be preserved. This is our Shimla team working to preserve, study and share them, our wonderful fantastic team that we are all so lucky to, to be a part of. We are preserving what we call the oldest books in North America because we believe that they are books. And for nearly 25 years, we have been preserving and sharing this library of painted texts and the information they hold. And we do this in four primary ways, documentation, research, stewardship, and education. We are a nonprofit, fully independent organization. Through documentation, we preserve the books by gathering as much detail and data and imagery about each mural as we can. And we just completed what we called the Alexandria Project after a different library that did not have the Shimla team <laughs> when it was <laughs> being lost um, to protect it. In the four years between 2017 and 2020, we digitally documented 235 rock art panels, often with our interns and students in tow we matched each site, mapped, sorry, mapped each site, completed site forms, 
and we gathered high resolution images to develop giga panoramas and 3D models. So here at Starburst Shelter, Sunburst Shelter, I'm gonna show you how closely you can zoom into a gigapan to see the detail of these incredible murals. I'm gonna actually go back and let you see that again. This is the figure that we're zooming in on right here. Here again. This beautiful wrist adornment. Do you see that speech breath? I love that. So, so very close. So you would not have to be in that shelter to study this mural. You could be in Timbuktu. And if you have access to the data that we have gathered, you can zoom in to such a degree that you can really do some serious research on these murals, which we want. We want people to research them. We also um, gather, uh, create 3D models from using structure from motion photogrammetry. And together, the 3D model kind of gives you a sense of the, the concavity of the mural and the way that the artists used the back wall, because they often used ridges and different places and water seeps. Um, and that's important to, to capture that information. But the 2D gigapan will allow you to zoom in to such detail that you can truly see the, just the very close up, almost sand grain um, paint. Research is also part of our mission. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about our research in a second because that has to do with the radiocarbon dating. But we study these murals through sci scientifically through many interdisciplinary methods. And one of them is chemistry. We're gonna come back to that in just a second. <clears throat> we also preserve the books through stewardship. Most of the sites are on private property. So we work directly with the landowners um, to gain access and to, to kind of help them to become stewards and conservatives, conservators um, of the rock art on their property. We hold community events. We gather all those who care for the rock art. So including those like the Border Patrol or the, the National Park Service who will come in contact with the rock art and um, you know, kind of need to know how to, to be around the rock art and how important it is. And the best part, is when we get to take landowners and particularly generations of landowners to sites on their property because they immediately become rock art conservators. When we show them these incredible sites and we explain to them the depth of time and the super complexity of the, the belief systems that were painted on these walls, then they are much more excited about acting on their behalf and making sure that people can't gain access to them, that animals and, and other, um, like their goats maybe, or, or um, sheep, that they will be kept away from them, that, that they're making sure things aren't growing <clears throat> on the walls. So it's just a wonderful, wonderful partnership. And we also preserve the books through education, teaching generations who will care for the resource now and into the future about how to care for the rock art. Uh, we run the Shumla Scholars Program, which is an award-winning winning program we do with Comstock ISD, which is the, um, the uh, uh, K through 12 school in our, in our uh, community. And we were actually written up in Texas Co-op Power about that, it's wonderful. They called it the rock stars. <clears throat> and we also run a very, um, uh, you know, kind of difficult uh, to get into <laughs> internship program. Um, highly competitive and have wonderful, wonderful interns that come and work with us. They have to come for 10 weeks at least um, and they get wonderful, wonderful uh, training. So I promised to tell you more about our current project and this is a perfect time to, to switch into that place. This is our former intern, Ashley Busby, who is now one of our Hearthstone Project um, team members. And you can see there, she is looking at the way that the art at Fateville Shelter was, was produced. So let's get on to the Hearthstone Project. This is a collaborative effort between Texas State and Shumla, um, partially funded by two grants, um, national grants that Carolyn Boyd, Karen Steelman, and Bill Daring um, were awarded, one from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the other from the National Science Foundation. These are our team leads, Karen Steelman on the left, Carolyn Boyd, and Phil Daring. The name comes from the Mesoamerican fire hearth. In Mesoamerican households, the fire hearth 
was made with three stones that provide a really stable support for the Kamal and had a very symbolic meaning. The hearth, hearth was in the center of the dwelling and um, there was just a lot of symb symbolism around those three hearthstones. Our project is supported by three solid pillars of inquiry, archeological science, formal art analysis, and indigenous knowledge. Our goal is to answer some of our most fundamental questions about the Pecos River style art. Questions that you've probably been answering, asking yourself as I've been presenting. So starting with archeological science, I'm gonna run through our questions and our methods super quick with you um, before we get to the, the question and answer portion of our, of our um, lunch and learn today. So our research questions, what figures and motifs represent core cosmological concepts in the archaic period? So we already know about crenellated arches and, and other things, but what are they representing and, and how um, pervasive across the landscape are they? Are other murals compositional and narrative like the white shaman mural? At all the sites that we have thus far um, done microscopy, we have found the black, then red, then yellow, then white pattern. And we want to make sure that this isn't a fluke, you know, at these six or nine sites that we have discovered this at, um, you know, is this something that we see repeatedly across the landscape? <coughs> when did Pecos River style mural production begin and end? This will involve radiocarbon dating. Is there temporal variation in anthropomorphs and attributes? So once we have radiocarbon date different sites, Will we find that, for example, the crenellated arch was introduced as a, as a um, motif uh, around the turn of the century, you know, or the turn of the millennia, um, or, you know, what, what kinds of things might we find in patterning across time? Do changes in mural production or imagery align with social and economic changes that we know about in the late archaic? So when we're studying the deposits with other archeologists, um, what are we finding in terms of there's a, a, a period of drought? Was there a change in art at that time, for example? And finally, does iconography change during the late archaic when Mesoamerica was developing more and Teotihuacan was being established? To answer these questions, we're going to identify and photograph um, pictographic elements, conduct digital microscopy, as I already told you, of intersecting layers, identify core motifs, collect paint samples and oxalate samples. I'm gonna explain the radiocarbon dating in a second. And importantly, create a chronology of the Pecos River style art aligned with social, economic and climate changes of the archaic period. For formal art analysis, we want to know, are there consistent rules of paint application at multi multiple mural sites across the region? Did the Pecos River style artists use other mark making techniques um, that we haven't yet found out about? Do pictographic elements recur in specific patterns and associations? And what temporal variation as we rated carbon date these sites are we finding? In order to do that, Ashley will conduct um, analysis to identify compositional structure, including authorship, elements of design, identify relationships among figures, balance, proportion, patterning, unity, dis disunity create written descriptions and artistic reproductions, analyze the artistic pro process, how the lines, how the shapes were, were produced, the use of space, what colors were used, the types of textures that might be used, and align all of these findings with our radiocarbon dating. And finally, indigenous knowledge. We wanna know, are these recurring pictographic elements still recognizable? to modern indigenous societies whose beliefs emerged from ancient Mesoamerican traditions? Are there recurring elements that are more read readily recognizable to the Huichol than others? And can the Huichol <clears throat> offer insights into the image making process of the pictographs or the patterns in the Pegasus River style and the narratives that they portray? And truly also to ask them, what have we missed? What are we not paying attention to? You know, what? What more should we be looking for? What angles might we be um, not, not knowing about from you know, the way that we were raised and the way our brains work? Um, so really, really excited um, to get their um, consultation. Um, to do this, uh, Dr. Carolyn Boyd and Dr. Phil Daring are going to travel with um, Jim, Dr. Jim Bommel and Dr. Stacy Schaefer to um, Real de Catorce to meet with the Huichol. Uh, Stacy and Jim have worked with the Weechel for over 40 years 
um, <clears throat> can speak their language and are uh, you know really familiar with the symbols and things that they've used to communicate. And we have also already gotten permission to go, which is pretty incredible because it's a very um, very small community that is very tightly woven and and don't often have um, people come into that community. So this is a really big deal. Um, Carolyn and, and Phil will present uh, different artists in the community, shaman and others um, with scrolls of both the actual rock art sites um, depicted as well as our um, renderings to elicit discussion and record how the Weichel con consultants relate these images to their cosmology. All our methods work together to answer these questions. And since building a chronology is such an important part of our project, I wanna talk a little bit more about that aspect. Each paint layer that we determine through these photomicrographs correspond to <clears throat> a data point in the matrix that shows the full stratigraphy of the mural. The matrix provides invaluable data, not only to identify mural stratigraphy, but also for choosing locations for collecting paint samples for radiocarbon dating. By sampling these interwoven figures, we can collectively date an entire mural. So do you remember this figure, for example? This was interwoven. So if we took a date from perhaps this yellow, we could then by, or, or from this black, I guess, um, we could then effectively be dating this yellow arch as well. So unlike radiocarbon dating usually, where for example, if you were gonna radiocarbon date a piece of charred wood from a, an old hearth, you would take a really large sample and they would combust it in order to get the, um, the carbon atoms out of it to be able to count them. Well, in paint, the organic part of the paint is the, is the binder. So that is the fat that was used to create the paint. And in order to extract the organic carbon, if you can imagine doing it the old fashioned way, we would basically have to take the whole mural off the wall to get enough of that organic binder to, to, to count the carbon atoms. However, Dr. Karen Steelman and her um, professor, Dr. Marvin Rowe, over the last 20 years have refined the process of um, plasma oxidation to combust tiny samples of rock art and gather the um, carbon atoms such that they can be counted. So there are many protocols necessary to extract the datable ca carbon. And she's using our um, NSF supported multi-sample chamber uh, plasma oxidation system at, at Shimla to process these samples. <coughs> Karen not only processes the paint, she also attempts to extract carbon, organic carbons from the underlying and overlying accretion layers because this mirror, uh, material is also um, biological and datable. So if you look, this is the rock wall here at the bottom. This is the accretion that was growing on the wall. And then this is the paint layer. So the paint layer was laid down on top of this accretion that was growing on the rock wall. Then after the paint was laid down over the course of thousands of years, the accretions have continued to grow on top. What this allows us to do is bracket our dates. So here at, uh, this is Eagle Cave, Dr. Steelman obtained three dates from paint samples and, and they were here in this kind of a little um, more recent than 2000 period, um, which when we dated the lower accretion and the upper accretion that bracketed that paint layer date and really gives us a good sense of the accuracy of, of what, what we're, what we're doing. All right, but I told you there's over 300 sites, so we can't do this at all of them. Um, but with the Alexandria Project Archive, we can select the sites that are best able to give us the information that we need. So we will conduct aspects of the Hearthstone Project at Fateville Shelter, Panther Cave, Rattlesnake Canyon, Halo Shelter, Jackrabbit Shelter, Jaguar Shelter, and some others, painted for over 4,000 years to communicate. Thank you so much for reading it with me today. It's just so exciting to share this with you guys. Um, to learn more, we're gonna have a question and answer session here in a second, but please visit uh, shumla.org, uh, follow the Hearthstone blog, you can sign up for our e-newsletter. We always talk about um, our newest discoveries and what's coming up next. 
Uh, you can sign up for a trek. You can come and tour with us. Um, an, a Shimla archaeologist will take you to these sites and tell you the things that we would never have time to tell you during a lunch and learn. Uh, find us on the socials, as they are now called, uh, Facebook and Instagram. And please, please consider donating. Uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit, and we really need your help to preserve the art, spark these kinds of discoveries. This is truly cutting edge research. Um, you know, there was a time when no one thought anyone would ever understand the Maya. And now we have an entire industry of Mayanology because the Maya hieroglyphs were deciphered and there is so much to be learned from um, the Maya civilization, for example. I feel like we're at the cutting edge of that for the Lower Pecos rock art um, and it's gonna be really incredible. So you can, you can be a part of that by, uh, by supporting us. So thank you so, so, so much. I am going to stop sharing my screen and I will look at first the chat questions. Oh, wonderful. Well, that's just a wonderful, lovely thank you. Oh, that's a thank you too. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> All right, so um, please feel free to take yourself off mute or raise your hand. Um, I don't know how many people we have with us right now, but um, Emil, I think, can we just have people ask a question or should we use the chat? I think we can go either way. We're, we're right at about 53 people right now. Oh my goodness, yay. Well, we'll start with, um, oh, here from Michelle. Uh, the speaking dots from the paintings, is that representative of praising a deity? Oh, that's a wonderful question. And there is an article recently um, published in Latin American Antiquity. If you look up speech breath, just Google, speech breath and Latin American Antiquity, um, you will find a article about speech breath. But yes, a lot of um, what she's connecting, and you'll see it in that article, um, there are what, what we're calling sort of supplicants, kind of a larger um, image, and then figures around it with breath going toward that, that larger central image. It's really beautiful, really incredible. Uh, let me look again. Um, now over, I'm now over, oops, over 1,000 miles from Southwest Texas and wonder if y'all have ch challenges from the open border. You know what? We really don't. Um, it's a wonderful question. And, and it's a question we get quite a lot since we lead tours. Um, we, we have such an amazing relationship uh, with the Border Patrol. They are kind of our first line of um, safety if we ever get in a jam. But we have not, uh, you know, a knock on wood, um, ever <clears throat> had any, any problem in terms of, of the border. Um, people crossing generally are trying not to be seen. Um, so we, you know, we, we live and work in Comstock and have done for 25 years and, and really are not having a problem with that. We keep very well informed and have, uh, you know, updates uh, from Border Patrol that we're, we're very, very safe and secure. Um, let me make this bigger so I can see these chat questions. Okay, uh, let me make sure I didn't miss any dates published. Okay, uh, the relationship to Mesoamerica and the consist, oh yes, okay. Uh, speech breath article. Oh, Katie reminded me the speech breath article is also available on the Shimla website. Katie Wilson is our um, outreach coordinator and she runs the, the Trex program. So I can't wait for you all to meet her. Um, have you thought about dating the two winged shamans at Fitting Bell? Um, we have and, and we asked, but we have not gotten permission yet. Um, so we, we're waiting for permission from Texas Parks and Wildlife. Um, and, you know, it, it could be days, months, years, I'm not sure, but we definitely would love to uh, radiocarbon date Fate Bell and, uh, and Panther and other sites. Um, and that will completely depend as, as it always does on uh, the permission of the landowner. Um, yeah, how are they being preserved? Great question, Pat. Unfortunately, the rock art cannot be preserved in situ. We can't put anything on the, the art that would keep it safe because the percolation of the, the water through the limestone would come out from the back. And so there, you know, and things have been tried in the past um, and, and to very, very unfortunate results. Um, we can't take the whole piece off the wall because they are so fragile and they're so enormous. You, you know, it's not like a small thing that maybe you could, you know, kind of get a giant piece and the small art would be in the center. They're so huge. We just, you know, what, what we can do and what, what we are doing is preserving them through the documentation and research and, and the stewardship of, of helping landowners to, to make sure that, 
you know, if they have, for example, a hunting lease that they educate their hunters on rock art that they may see to make sure that they don't put their name on it or something, you know, not malicious, but just not knowing, you know. I really appreciate everybody being here. It's so fun to, to see all your faces and um, just share this incredible resource. Um, and, you know, can't wait for you all to meet some of our new staff, uh, Katie Wilson, Seamus Anderson, we have another staff member coming next month um, and we're just going and blowing with our, our research and preservation documentation and um, just feel very, very lucky to do the job that we do. I wish there are more real colored photos. Oh, yes, absolutely. You know, David, that's a great question and I get that a lot. And part of the reason why we don't have as many um, beautiful rock art images is because we have um, different rules with different landowners on what we are allowed to share. So, um, you know, in a lunch and learn, for example, I can post a picture because it would, it's something that, you know, I guess you could print your screen, but it'd be really low resolution. Um, but a lot of the landowners are, are not, do not allow us to share images of their rock art in a way that could be kind of taken and used by someone else through the internet. So that's the reason that we don't show as much beautiful rock art images as we would love to do. Um, but definitely come back to our lunch and learns and we'll keep showing great images. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, can the Pegasus River flood and damage the art? Yes. So flooding is a, is a, is a very big problem. Um, and it seems silly to say that in a desert region during a drought. Um, but it's even worse, in fact, now, because then when we have a giant downpour, it just fills the canyons with water that is rushing toward the sea, and it hits the Amistad Reservoir, which is standing water um, that was built in, in 1969, <clears throat> and basically releases all the silt that it has rushed down the canyons carrying. And so the canyons are slowly filling up. This is called siltation. And, you know, everybody knew it was going to happen. I don't think people knew it was going to happen this quickly. Um, which means that every time the floor of the canyon is raised, the floods in the water level gets higher and higher and higher and closer and closer and closer to the art. So we, we have a very serious problem with um, losing art to flooding. Well, thank you everybody so much for being here. It's wonderful to see you. We will see you next, um, next time, Lunch and Learn. Oh gosh, I don't have it in front of me, but we will be posting on the internet and um, sending e-newsletters about next month's Lunch and Learn. Um, but until then, have a wonderful summer. Stay cool.